Did you see the, uh, the, the, the buzz on the internet has been the uh, statement that Zelensky made recently. Uh, unfortunately, he's going through a horrible, horrible time. He and his fellow countrymen in the wholesale slaughter of innocent citizens. And he made the statement before our Congress that this is what? This is the end of what? Anybody see it? Hear it? He says the end of the world. Zelensky, President Zelensky of Ukraine. He said, this is the end of the world. Don't you understand? This is the end of the world. And so someone texted me uh, this morning and asked me if I saw the statement or heard the statement and what my thoughts were. And I said, well, from, certainly from his perspective and what they're experiencing, it seems like the end of the world, doesn't it? But this is very clearly the end of the dispensation of what we call the church age. Very definitely. I think that's where we are in the prophetic timetable. In the prophetic clock, we said, what time is it? About 11.59. 11.59. Yeah, the midnight hour is about, about to uh, approach us. And so mo now more than ever, we all need to take very, very seriously our relationship with the Lord. You know, whatever degree, I, as I've shared with you before, and every one of you know it's true, that there's this, this public man, woman that we present to those who we are acquainted with. And we always want to make that person look very presentable, don't we? Hmm? That public persona. But then there's the reality of the shadow person that you are. You know, who are you when nobody else knows? Who are you when the lights are out? Who are you when you're alone with your thoughts and your desires and your ambitions, your cravings? And unfortunately, that's who you really are. Do you understand that? And so my encouragement has been to you for the last several months is to bring those two into alignment where there's no hypocrisy in your life. Because all hypocrisy will be judged. God will not be mocked. Your sin will find you out right now. Now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, right? But don't you want to go home with your head held high that you can say, Lord, at least I did all that you called me or told me to do, right? A steward, it's required of a steward to be found what? Faithful. And so we need to make sure that we are faithful with what God has given us, particularly our lives, every single breath. Can't get tomorrow back, can we? Can't redeem the days that are behind us. But we surely can make a difference in the days that are ahead of us, can't we? Hmm? I can make a difference today. And my today can determine my tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I do believe if we are at that time, that 11th hour, 11.59, this is the end of the disposition of the church age, and it is absolutely essential that each of us do a self-examination. I don't need to worry about you. I don't need to worry about anybody out there. I need to worry about my relationship with the Lord, and so do you. Hmm? Daniel was such a wonderful example of a life lived for the Lord from beginning to end wasn't he? And here we are at the end of Daniel chapter 12. I hate to even part with the book, but it's been such a wonderful study. In chapter 12, we saw, we went, went as far as verse 1, I think, last time, and Glenn said he read ahead. He went to verse 2. <laughs> but we saw that uh, the prince that watches over Israel, Michael, at that time, Michael, verse 1, chapter 12 of Daniel, at that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. When he's speaking to Daniel about his people, he's obviously speaking about the Jews. Michael's commission, mandate from heaven is to watch over the Jews in Israel. It's the only nation on the face of the earth that's gained a favored nation status in the eyes of the Lord. God has guaranteed that Israel will exist throughout eternity. In Romans, it tells us that Israel, all Israel shall be saved. Now, it doesn't mean every single Jew. That's an inappropriate interpretation. But he means Israel as a nation, as an identifiable people group, an ethnic group will exist throughout all eternity. He shall stand, that great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Jesus referred to that time of trouble. Never before. And it'll never be again, but it's yet future. I do think that the world is so crazy today that we will unleash nuclear weapons. And the nuclear weapons that exist today are a thousand times more powerful than the weapons that were dropped in Japan 
in World War II. Do you understand that? We really don't have any idea of the destructive capability of one nuclear submarine with a multitude of warheads, of missiles, and each missile has a multitude of warheads, each capable of taking out a major city. But that's the scenario that the Bible presents for us at the end of time. When we turn from God, the only thing we turn to is our own destruction. Don't we? Hmm. This time of trouble that's coming will make what happened in World War II seem like a child's play. Yes, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Where does he promise that deliver? Romans chapter 11, verse 26. All Israel shall be saved. God will deliver Israel. If God is not faithful to the promises he has made unilaterally to Israel, then there's no reason for us to hold dear the promises he made to us. Right? But unfortunately today, more and more people are embracing an anti-Semitic attitude, what we call replacement theology, believing that the church has somehow replaced Israel, and the promises that were given to Israel now belong to the church. Well, what about the curses? They don't seem to take those on, do they? No. That God has a very specific and a definite plan for Israel, and it involves this world, this life. He has a definite and specific plan for the church, and it involves the world to come. The kingdom to come. Hmm? Everyone who is written in the book. What book might that be? The book of life. Right? Yeah. So we're talking about the deliverance of Israel. And now, now the angel is going to reveal. Who's the angel that's speaking to Daniel at this point? Gabriel. 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 Michael's the one who stands charge over Israel. I think he's the angel, the archangel spoken of in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord does send from heaven with a shout with a voice. voice of the archangel. I think that's Michael's voice. I think he's the one who will give that shout. But nonetheless, we saw the deliverance of Israel, verse 1. We see the reject, re resurrection of the people. Verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life some to shame and everlasting contempt. Ooh, quite a contrast, isn't it? Hmm? Do you believe in soul sleep? There's a lot of nonsense that goes around the church, unfortunately, about soul sleep. The Bible does not support any doctrine of soul sleep, any belief that, that your, your soul goes to sleep when you die and it'll be awakened at the resurrection. Your body may be buried into the ground, and your soul is separated, your spirit is separated from the body, but we know that today, to be absent from the body, every single saint that dies, that exhales here for the last time, where do you inhale? Heaven. Heaven God's kingdom. So we will inhale in God's kingdom. There's no such thing as soul sleep, but sleep here, and the Bible uses sleep likened unto death of the saints. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of every single one of his saints. It's wonderful to get a good night's sleep, isn't it? The older you get, the more good night's sleep seems to escape you. <laughs> and so when you do get a good night's sleep, oh, it's so grateful for it, right? You feel refreshed, renewed, strengthened. Hmm? Yeah, so they liken sleep, they liken death to sleep. I find that very comforting. But some to everlasting life. Now, when would that happen? When will these people awake to everlasting life? When will that resurrection be? Hmm? At the parousia, the parousia, huh? When the Lord comes, right? That's what that Greek term, that's how they would greet one another. The early church saints, it was parousia. means simply the coming. How do the Spaniards say it? Adios. Adios. If you uh, have any interactings with people whose first language is Spanish, you should ask them, Why do you, how do you say goodbye? And they'll say adios. And you say, wait a minute, wait, what does dios mean? Dios means God. Why do you say adios? Because the Spaniards in Spain took on the, the uh, same uh, belief as the Greeks in the early church, but the Greeks would say parousia, the coming, the Spaniards would just say until God. Ah, Dios, until God comes, right? The first resurrection of the faithful will be at the beginning of the thousand-year reign of Christ. The day of the Lord. Joel talks about the day of the Lord. Go to Joel chapter 2 for a minute. Joel 
Joel chapter 2. When you're there, just look up. Blow the trumpet in Zion. You got it? Everybody there? Joel 2. Verse 1. 2 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is a day at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come great and strong, and like of whom's never been before, never been. Nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. Look at the end of the chapter, verse 31. 30. 29. 28. Go to 28. Chapter 2, verse 28 of Joel. And it shall come to pass afterwards, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see visions. Who's he speaking of? Israel, Israel the Jews. Yes. And also on the maid, manservants and on your maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This is the fulfillment of Zechariah. He talks about the spirit of God, the Ruach Godesh, coming upon the Jewish people and awaking them. Saving them, the spirit of grace and supplication. And they'll see Jesus for who he really is. Verse 30, and I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. All happens at the same time before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So before the coming of the Lord, that's what's going to happen. These signs in the heavens. And it shall come to pass that whoever, whoever, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hmm. We believe in the exclusivity of Christ, right? Is there but one way? You sure of that? Only one way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In the contemporary church today, they believe that there are many ways. It's a denial of the truth of the gospel. There's only one way. The exclusivity of Christ and allowing us to enter into heaven through faith in him alone, right? But it's open to everyone, everyone. It excludes no one. Hmm? For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So don't for a moment think that anyone is destined to hell by God's choosing. Anyone who goes to hell goes there because they've chosen to go there. They've walked over the cross of Christ. Yes, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. It's always been a remnant, hasn't it, beloved? You go through all of the Old Testament, it's just a remnant in Israel. Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years. 40 years, that great Jeremiah. There's so many similarities you can make between the ministry of Jeremiah and Jesus. It's quite a good study, just as if you know, the similarities you can make between Joseph of Egypt and Jesus. Almost 300 analogies in the life of Joseph and Jesus. But Jeremiah, a great man of God, 40 years pouring out his heart with tears. And how many converts did he have? One. 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 He spoke to a dying and a rebellious generation. Doesn't it seem like that's what we're experiencing today? Hmm? Hmm. No, there's only one way, and that way is through Christ. But many, many are denying that way today. But here in chapter 2, uh, uh, verse 2 of chapter 12 of Daniel, he speaks of those who would be resurrected to everlasting life. It would be those who embrace faith in Jesus Christ. And that begins at the beginning of the thousand-year reign. We talk about the day of the Lord. When does the day of the Lord begin? The rapture. the rapture of the church. And when does it end? At the end of the millennial reign of Christ. It's a long day. The day is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. Psalm 90 would declare Peter gave us the interpretation of that. Some of the prophecies in the scripture, as in Hosea, can only be understood as you understand that context. Where in Hosea, he said, I'll, I'll tear you, but then I will mend you. You will be broken, but then you will be healed in two days, for two days. But the third day, I'll raise you up and dwell within your sight. So the Jews have been dispersed, the diaspora, throughout the nations of the world, Right? God is about to begin that 70th seven of Daniel that Daniel talked about in chapter 9. The last seven-year period of history. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. We'll get further into chapter 12. 
But I think we're going to be entering into that 70th seven of Daniel, of, uh, Daniel very soon. The heptad, the last heptad. God judges all of human history in the way in which he's dealing with his people Israel. And we are in a dispensation called the church age. The diaspora occurred. The 69 sevens have passed. And the people were dispersed. God spread them throughout the nations of the world. But God created a safe place for the Jews until they would be regathered back into the land. Where's that safe place? It was America, the United States of America. It's amazing how many people don't know that Christopher Columbus was an Italian by nationality. And I can understand that. You ever have sausage and peppers? <laughs> he was an Italian by nationality, but by ethnicity, what was he? Yeah, Christopher Columbus was Jewish. Most people don't know that. Christopher Columbus was looking for a safe place for Jews, for the Jewry to go during the Inquisition, the persecution that was taking place in Europe. And what did he discover? And what has America been? America has been the safest place for the Jew ever since the diaspora. And now, and now with the regathering, the Aliyah that's taking place, the regathering of the Jews back into the land, has God fulfilled his purposes and plans for America? I think he has. I think he has. We're no longer that shining light upon a hill, are we? We always stood for, for truth and justice and the American way, right? Isn't that what Superman told us? When he was standing here with his, his cape flowing? Truth, justice, and the American way? I, I can't help but think that if I saw someone on the street right now raping some woman, even though he might have a gun or some other lethal weapon, I'd have to do whatever I had to do to try to save that woman. Right? That's the, yeah, now people take, get their phones out and take videos of it. But listen, that's precisely what we're doing in watching the slaughter of all these innocent people in Ukraine. We have nuclear weapons. We have a more powerful military and the weapons that our military has than does Vladimir Putin. Why aren't we putting fear in him? It's, it's, it's cowardice what we become. You saw the survey where they asked the question if a similar type of invasion would happen here in the United States, would you stay and fight or would you leave the country? Did you see the survey? The majority of Democrats said they would leave the country. The majority of liberals said they'd leave the country. The majority of Republicans say they would stay and fight. Quite a contrast, isn't it? But there used to be a day in this country where every American would say, well, stay and fight. The greatest generation. What generation was that? The World War II generation. Many, many, many of our fathers and our uncles went overseas not knowing whether they'd come back or not. But they went there for the right cause, to destroy evil. The axis of evil then had to be destroyed, and there's an axis of evil now. But we're not going to destroy. God himself will destroy this axis of evil. Why? Because they're going to turn upon his own, upon Israel. But those who are faithful will raise to everlasting life, life without age and age abiding life. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a wonderful promise? You ever worry about anything? How many times a day? You know, I can imagine what my brothers and sisters are, are worried about. You know, Ukraine uh, is a, a very uh, much uh, a Christian nation in that the populace, the people, have embraced Christianity quite significantly. Ukraine is called the Bible Belt of Europe. Did you know that? Yeah. There are many, many, many evangelical churches and believers in Ukraine. And they can't help it that it's a corrupt country. Oh, wait a minute. Aren't there... A significant number of believers here in the United States? Can we help it that the nation is so corrupt that our federal government is now a criminal agent? See, a criminal organization? You got the Biden cartel? I mean, it's true, isn't it? The corruption, the criminality. But that's not a reflection upon us, is it? It's not who we are. Well, it's not who the church is in Ukraine either. So it's true that Ukraine is the, the Bible belt of Europe. And so many of our brothers and sisters there, they're clinging to that hope that we're talking about right now, that hope of eternal life, where there'll be no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more cries, no more tears. 
They will never, you know, you understand that forever. Forever, we will never, ever, ever again have an anxious, concerning, troubling thought, ever. Think about that. Wow, that is heaven. Hmm? Hmm. But look at the opposite. In some, to shame and everlasting contempt. Is there shame today? No, there's no shame. It's amazing how, how blatant, how brazen people are in their sin and the parading of their sin. Oh, but they're going to awake to shame and to everlasting contempt. What's going to be convicting them more than anything else during this time of everlasting contempt, everlasting judgment, punishment, sorrow, anguish? Their conscience. The conscience is a mechanism that God has given every one of us to lead us in good, in the right. It affirms us when we're doing the right. It accuses us when we're doing the wrong. That's how the conscience is supposed to work. Parents are sp- simply to inform their children's conscience well so that the conscience mechanism will work as it's supposed to. And they'll hear our little voice when they start to go in the wrong direction. They'll hear that, that, that uh, approving voice when they go in the right direction. But the Bible says you can go into the blatant, willful practice of sin. We call that a transgression, right? There's sins, that's simply missing the mark. But then there's transgressions. What is that? You deliberately cross the line. And that's a display of your iniquitous little, what is it? Heart, your iniquity. Iniquities are your, your wicked, evil, rebellious heart. That's what iniquities are. Your iniquitous heart. Jeremiah tells us the heart is incurably wicked, evil. Hmm? But God can cure our heart, right? But when you purpose to go over that line and you go over that line and you go over that line, then what happens to your conscience? It gets defiled. You defile the conscience. You defile the conscience by watching things you shouldn't watch, by hearing things you shouldn't hear, by doing things you shouldn't do, by desiring things you shouldn't desire. And so the more you defile your conscience, and eventually what happens to the conscience? It becomes seared, seared. In the Civil War, when they'd have to amputate to one of the soldiers, whether it's their arm or the leg or whatever, what would they do right after the amputation? Cauterize it. Burn it. Your conscience becomes seared. It becomes numbed. You become cast in that disposition where you, you can't change any longer. And then you go from a defiled conscience to a seared conscience, and eventually, what does the Bible say? You develop a evil conscience, reprobate mind. Romans 1, verse 24, I give them the word to a sexual revolution. After that, Romans 1, verse 26, I've given you over to a homosexual revolution. Isn't that what's happened so far? I grew up in the sexual revolution of the 60s. We see what's happening with the homosexual revolution today and the gender dysphoria and all of the madness that's taking place. Then lastly, verse 28, he said he gave them over to what? An evil conscience, a reprobate mind, a twisted mind where you can't even think. You wonder how in the world do our leaders make the decisions they're making? It's that twisted, evil, reprobate mind, that evil conscience that they've developed now. Where the President of the United States can come before us and lie day after day after day after day right to our face. We'd say like Pilate, where's truth? Where's truth? Hmm. Well, every devil gets there and every saint there Make no mistake. That's the promise we have. That's what we hold clear to. Yes, some to everlasting life. That's us, beloved. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. But those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. How's your efforts of evangelism going? How are you doing as a witness of Christ? Are you bold and loving in your proclamation of the truth of Jesus Christ? Or do you only speak of him in whispers? Hmm? This is what he's talking about here. Let's see, Sunday we're talking about some of the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Logos Sophia, what was that? The word of wisdom. 
Sophia's wisdom. Logos Sophia, word of wisdom. Logos Gnosis. Logos Gnosis. Word of knowledge. Word of knowledge. So when you have a word of knowledge, and particularly what he's talking about there, a knowledge and an understanding in your heart of the belief of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that all that God has said is true. And there's many mysteries in here, right? The mysterians of God are a truth that he reveals to the church, still a mystery to the world. And one of the greatest mysteries is the gospel itself. For by grace you have been saved through? And not under your own, a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast, right? It's all of God. But God has given you the grace gift of faith to believe that word of knowledge. <laughs> it's all true. Is it? You sure? It's going to be more and more under attack. We live in a society that is so hostile to everything we hold dear now. Every major institution in the country is hostile towards Christianity and towards what we believe. But that knowledge that God gives us, that epinosis, right? That knowledge that comes from above, comes upon us. We exercise that in wisdom, in wise living. And what's the wise living? In living in accordance with his will for our life and then sharing he and his will with everyone that we can. Amen? How do you think the church is doing? Not, not too good. It's no look too good, like my grandfather would say. It's no look too good. <laughs> Christian parents today, younger generation, not my generation, the one behind me, Christian parents today, only 2% share what with their children? A world biblical view. 2%. Only 2%. Now, when I was raising my son, and that was a long time ago, he's, he's going to be 52. <laughs> so it was a while ago. But I was working overtime because he was in the public school arena, and I was working overtime to make sure he had a biblical worldview. I had to work very hard at that. I can't imagine what it must be like today, especially if your children are going to government school and all of the things that they're bombarded with on a daily basis. But we have to give them an understanding of a biblical worldview. Whose world is this? It's God's. And he's going to take possession of it again, isn't it? How was paradise lost? We forfeited. Our first parents forfeited. The title deed was given over to Satan. But Jesus has redeemed. He has redeemed the field, the world, for the treasure that lied therein. What's the treasure? You. You. The church. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Yes, those who are wise shall shine like the firmament. Those who turn many to righteousness. Is it your righteousness? No. The Holy Spirit comes to convict of what? Sin? Righteousness? Judgment to come. Contemporary church wants to talk a lot about righteousness. Whose righteousness? Theirs. Their own. They think, <laughs> they think they're offering God a prize when they come to him. <laughs> Doing God a favor. No. First, you've got to get them lost before you can get them saved, right? The Holy Spirit's come to convict of sin. I have no inclination towards God whatsoever. As a matter of fact, my flesh hates the Word of God. Do you know that about yourself? Truly, your flesh hates the Word of God. But my spirit rejoices in it. But I need a righteousness that's apart from the law, apart from anything I could do, apart from my performance. Whose righteousness do I need? Christ. What's his name? And he'll have a new name, Jeremiah tells us. Jehovah? Mikodesh Kem. I am the one who sanctifieth thee, makes you righteous. Our righteousness is in Christ. He doesn't look down upon you any longer, Miss Gale, and see your sin. But he looks down in you, and he sees the son of his love, the righteousness of Christ. You went from being the object of his perfect wrath, everlasting shame and contempt, to the object of his perfect love. <laughs> we sang this evening that we adore him, right? We adore you, Lord. We adore you. And now the Father adores us because we are in him whom he adores. Hmm? But you, Daniel, now Daniel, it's, it's amazing that Daniel really didn't understand what he wrote. The majority of what he wrote, some of it was fulfilled in his lifetime as uh, an example, the conquering of the, Me of the Persians, conquering over the Babylonians. 
He predicted that. He didn't see the conquering of the Medo-Persians by the Greeks or the Greeks by the Romans, etc., etc. And so much of what he prophesied was yet to take place. Now we know that there's very little yet to take place that Daniel had prophesied. But when Daniel wrote the book, he didn't understand what he was writing. Imagine that. Ezekiel. Ezekiel had very little understanding of what he saw and what he was writing. 2,500 years ago, these desert prophets, and, and Daniel traveled extensively, but, but Ezekiel, for instance, probably didn't travel much farther beyond Israel than 50 miles or so until he was carried away into captivity. And yet he sees so clearly into the future. We can get commentary on current events by reading the Bible. Not the newspaper. What is a newspaper? Somebody told me about that the other day. I don't know what that is. <laughs> but isn't it amazing how my Bible, your Bible, is interpreting what's taking place in our world today? Wow. Exciting. But you, Daniel, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the words, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. What's the time of the end? The day of the Lord. Look at verse 9. Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Look at verse 13. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and arise in your inheritance at the end of the days. Listen. There is a limited amount of time that the world has before the Lord comes to judge the victim of sin, of righteousness, and is it going to happen? What's the difference between Acts 5 and now? What happened in Acts 5? Ananias and Sapphira, what did they do? They lived a hypocritical life. They tried to present themselves as one thing outwardly, publicly, but... but Secretly, that shadow person was really controlling their life. And what was their number one greed? <laughs> what, was their, what was their number one problem? <laughs> Money. Aren't we glad that nobody has that problem today? The church is so honest to God, aren't they? They came before Peter and they said, we've sold our property and here it is. We've given you all. Ananias. Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit, Peter said. And immediately he dropped dead, didn't he? They carried him out. They've just finished carrying him out the door, and here comes his wife, and she said the same thing. All that we say, here it is. And they were both judged instantly because of their hypocrisy. The only difference between Acts 5 and now is a matter of timing. That's all. God's being patient. Oh, 2% of parents today teach their children a biblical worldview, right? What do we know about 2% of the church? They tithe. John Michael, you got some chicken buckets ready? We're going to shake them down now. No? You know, we've, 30 years we've been operating, we've never taken an offering. But once. Once we took an offering for a family whose child needed an operation, and they didn't have the money. And so we took an offering, and it was amazing. Our little congregation paid for the surgery. But that's the only time we've taken an offering. And you know, the only other time we ask for money is when? Samaritan's Purse, Voice of the Martyrs. What did you say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The only time I'll talk about it is when it's in the, in the scriptures. Right? Thank you, thank you. But if you've been here any length of time at all, you know that we don't start. Where God guides, God provides. Absolutely. So I never worry about it, and we've never have, and, and God has always taken care of our every need. You know? Sure, I wanted a private jet, but you don't know how many. <laughs> no. But isn't, listen, isn't it a shocking thing? Listen to me. What percentage of the church ties today? What does, that, what does that say of the other 98? They're not trusting God. Isn't that amazing? The one place that God says to test him through the Italian prophet Malachi, right? Malachi. Malachi says, test me and see if I will not open up windows in heaven and shower down upon you blessings for which you do not have room enough to contain. That's called that seed faith. Give a thousand, you get ten back. You hear these hucksters. Is that what he's referring to? No. That's just buying a lottery ticket. Right? That's all that is. That's lottery faith. 
No, God says, if you will give to me all of who you are, I will repay you by blessing you with relationship with me and others. For It'll just swell your heart. The most needful thing that we have as believers is to be able to draw close and experience his presence on a daily, continual basis. And that's the greatest blessing, isn't it? To know him and to make him known. Hmm. Hmm. Verse 5, I, then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on the river bank and the other on the other river bank. What river was he there? No, this is the Tigris, the Tigris River. Chapter 10, verse 4 tells us that. We've heard that previously. He's at the Tigris River, and there's two angels, one on one river bank, one on the other. And then, verse 6, and one said to the man clothed in linen. Who's that? That's probably Gabriel. I think that's Gabriel, yep. To the clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river. How long, how long shall the fulfillment of these things be? Now, he's talking more specifically about the end of chapter 11. What do we read about in the end of chapter 11? The great tribulation, the coming of the Antichrist, the man of sin, who worshiped the God of fortresses, worshiped Satan himself, and he takes control of the entire globe. The entire globe is marching towards socialism at best. But this man who's coming is going to have absolute control over the globe, except for one group of people. What group is that? The Chinese. The Chinese. And so when, when the forces of the Antichrist, the European army, comes down through the land of Israel into North Africa to conquer over that w part of the world, it will be for the same hook that goes into the jaw of Magog to bring them down into this conflict with Israel. Now, you, you do understand that the Gog-Magog invasion of Israel... Uh, Gog is the leader of Magog. Magog were the ancient Scythians. The ancient Scythians are the present day Russians. So this is the leader of Russia. Russia, the leader of Russia is going to get a hook put in his jaw to draw him down into the Middle East into a conflict with Israel. Now he's going to be joined by Persia. Persia is Iran. Iran. And he's going to be joined by Targama and, and Gomer. Who's that? Turkey. Turkey. Eastern Europe. So principal players, Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Wow, isn't that interesting? Wait a minute, wait a minute. 2,500 years ago, he wrote this? And never, ever, ever before had there been any kind of a military alliance between the Russians and the Iranians or the Persians, between the Russians and the Turks until this present day? Isn't that amazing? 2,500 years ago. Now, what's the hook in the jaw? Liquid natural gas. There's a, there's a gas field under the Mediterranean, that part of the sea border that Israel controls, that has a reserve far greater than anything that the rest of the Middle East has. Trillions of tons of natural gas. Now, the Trump administration was helping Israel, supporting them in their efforts to build a gas pipeline from those gas fields in the Mediterranean to Crete, to Italy, to Europe. To become a direct competitor with who? Russia, Vladimir Putin. Now, why has this present administration done everything they can to prevent that from happening? Why has this present administration done so much to help Russia? It's amazing, isn't it? But the hook in the jaw is going to be those gas reserves that Israel has to bring them down into that conflict. Now, that con when does that take place, do you think? Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> We're that close. But it's not the War of Armageddon, is it? War of Armageddon and, and the Gog Magog invasion, totally different groups of people. Different time period. I think it's the Gog Magog invasion of Israel that precipitates the coming of the Antichrist. He's the phoenix that rises up from the ashes. He makes a covenant with Israel for how long? One week. Daniel chapter 9. He makes a covenant with Israel for one week. What does he allow them to do? Rebuild their temple. The Orthodox Jew will tell you how you know when the Messiah comes, the Messiah will be a man as Moses was a man, but he will be the one to allow us to rebuild our temple. Isn't that amazing? 
Daniel gave us some insight into this man of sin, the Antichrist, who would come. It says that he would not have no regard for the God of his fathers. So what does that mean? That he must be part Jewish, at least. In part, the God of his fathers would speak of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And no desire for women. He does not have any desire for women. What does that speak of? It, it could be a double entendre. It could have two meanings. It could be that he's a homosexual. He doesn't desire women. He likes men. But what was the desire of every young Jewish maiden? To give birth to the Messiah. So I, I think both are true. I think he's probably a homosexual, hates Christ. Hmm? And then he worships the God of fortresses, the God of power, God of might. Satan himself is an occultist. Amazing. Amazing. But how long will it be when these things are all beginning to be fulfilled? Same question the disciples asked Jesus, didn't he? In the apocalyptic literature of uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, answers the same question. Verse 7, And then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, and it shall be a time, times, and half a time, when the power of the holy people has been completely scattered, all these things shall be finished. What's he saying? Time, times, and half a time. Three and a half years. That's three and a half years. 1,290 days. 1,290 days, and then what will be completed? The 70th, 7th of Daniel will be completed. That time period that Israel owes God. But what will happen to the Jew? There will be a holocaust like nothing they have ever seen before. We thought it was bad in World War II. The attempted genocide of the Jewish people by Hitler. We call that a holocaust. Why do they call it a holocaust? That's the, that's the exact Hebrew word for burnt offering. A burnt offering is a holocaust, where the entire animal is sacrificed unto the Lord. No part of that animal is consumed by the worshiper or by the priest. Every other sacrifice, it was shared. It's a shared communion meal. But the holocaust is completely consumed, the burnt offering. And the Bible tells us that the worst is yet to come for God's people, the Israel. Two-thirds of the Jews that are in the land today will be destroyed, will be killed. A third will escape, a remnant. Hmm. This is what he's referring to here. Oh, my, it's 8 o'clock. Although I heard, I did not understand. And I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. For many shall be purified, made white, and refined. How's that happen? Faith in Christ. The justification that comes by your faith in Jesus Christ alone. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, the abomination of desolation is set up. There shall be 1,290 days, 1,260 days completed the 70th seven of Daniel, that last heptad, but then there's 30 more days where he claims to be God himself. Jesus talks about the abomination that causes desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. He says, blessed is he, verse 12, verse, blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. So what is that about? Well, the 1,290 days is the second coming of Christ to establish his millennial reign, his kingdom on earth. And now he's going, to dis he's going to take possession of the world and he's going to displace those who don't belong here. How many days of judgment are going to take place? There's 45 days of judgment where he separates the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares. The tares, the bearded darnell. Last week when you came in, did you, did you smell that terrible stench out in the parking lot? Yeah. Did you? What was that? Some the Bradford pears. Me. What's a Bradford pear? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fake pear tree. No, it's, it's, a, it's a pear tree in name only. Yeah. Right? It, it doesn't produce any fruit, does it? Oh, it produces a blossom. Looks nice on the outside. But it... 
and it's fruitless. Right? A lot of Christians in name only today. Oh, they try to look good on the outside, but they, their behaviors, their attitudes, hmm, their desires, there's 45 days of judgment separating the lambs, the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares. What's the tares? The bearded darnel. You know something about the bearded darnel, that species of plant? Yeah, the enemy plants the tares, the tares among the wheat. It looks exactly like the wheat. When a stalk comes up and it grows, it looks exactly like the wheat until it's time for fruit, the grain of the wheat. It's fruitless, fruitless, like a Bradford pear, like the fig tree that Jesus cursed. Remember? I think it was uh, Luke. No, it was Matthew. Matthew 21. He's going to go and have this confrontation with the Jews once again. But before he goes in, there's a fig tree there, and its leaves are green. It should speak of having fruit. And he went over there, and it was fruitless. And the fig tree, in a figurative sense, always speaks of what? Israel, the nation of Israel. And Israel wasn't bearing any fruit for God whatsoever, so he cursed it and withered and died. The next day, as the disciples went by, you could kick the thing over. It was dead from the roots up. Cursed. And then, in a few chapters later, I think it's chapter 24, Matthew, he says, now learn this parable of the fig tree. When you see the leaves of the fig tree turn green, know that summer is near. Right? Fig trees are turning green now. It's the spring of the year. A fig tree always turns green if it's alive, right? In the spring of the year. And it speaks of the fruit that would come in summer. He's talking about Israel being born again. Israel was cursed, wasn't it? Just as he said... <coughs> Cast out among the nations of the world for almost 2,000 years now. Two days, I'll, I'll wound you. I'll break you. I'll tear you. But the third day, I'll raise you up and you'll dwell in my sight. We're approaching the third day. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Yes. yes. You just want to make sure that you know that you know that you know that you're genuine. You really are who you say you are. That you love Jesus more than anything else in this life. That's, that's really what's required. And, and as we mature and we, we progress in our relationship with the Lord, we fall more and more in love with him. He's so adoring, isn't he? I mean, who would love us the way he does? Who could we trust more than him? What possession? What pleasure? What position? Nothing. I love my wife. I love my life. I love my son. But, you know, I, I, I love the Lord more and I can't wait to be with him I can honestly say there's nothing nothing in my heart that I want more than Jesus to come if I could go right now at this moment I'd say bye <laughs> there's nothing holding me here not a thing and you know what people ask me well, well you know, how do I know that I'm going to be raptured well do you know that he's first in your heart do you that's the question. Is it your 401k? Is it your forever house? Sad if it is. Hmm? Is it another person? Is it your children? Is it your grandchildren? Is it your husband, your wife? Or maybe your lover? Sad. No one should come before him, and anything that does is called a idol. Idol. But you, Daniel, go your way till the time of the end, for you shall rest and arise in your inheritance at the end of days. Isn't that a comfort? I know it's a comfort for my brothers and sisters who are being slaughtered in the world today, the persecuted church, my brothers and sisters in Ukraine. What a comfort. And when you're approaching the end of life here, if you don't have that hope, boy, it'll be miserable. But you've, I've experienced people on both sides of that equation. I've experienced the death of people who had no hope and it's miserable. But I've experienced the death of those who have that hope and that assurance. And it's beautiful. It's wonderful. We're approaching the time of which the Bible speaks more of than any other. Any other. Sunday I told you the first coming of Christ was predicted. 
the second coming of Christ is predicted. But how many more times is a second coming predicted as opposed to the first? Nine times more. Nine times more does the Bible speak of the second coming of Christ than the first coming. And did the first coming not fulfill every single thing that was prophesied about him? Hmm? And we can be absolutely assured, so will the second. In the New Testament alone, every one out of every ten verses of Scripture talks about the second coming. How many people did you talk to when you mentioned the second coming? Oh, yeah, I believe it's coming, but just not now. What does that tell you? That, that tells you everything you need to know. The problem with the professing church, the problem with those who are Christian in name only, they're wed to this world. Not to the Lord. How many of you remember what a hope chest is? Well, some of you do. What's a hope chest, Carolyn? It's what a, uh, a drive to be has to put all the hurts and precious things. Yeah. Yes, yes. Days gone by, a, a woman would have a chest and she would put some precious things in there preparing for her wedding. Now it would have to be a warehouse, I guess. <laughs> but but that, that hope chest just spoke of the hope she had and that that day was going to come that where her bridegroom would come and take her and they would be wed and her hope would be fulfilled. Do you have that hope in your chest? Down in your heart? Do you? Do you store those things in your heart? Getting ready for the bridegroom to come? The Holy Spirit will cry out one day, the bridegroom cometh, the bridegroom cometh. And when will he come? The Jewish wedding? At night, at the midnight hour. And for most, he'll come as a thief in the night. But not you, beloved. No, you're not of the night, but you're of the day. And that day will not come upon you unaware. Maybe we'll talk more about that next week, okay? Shall we stand? Terry?